Good afternoon, everyone. All right. Uh, well, thank you all for coming uh, to the first session of uh, this afternoon's plenary. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here with my fellow panelists to moderate a really interesting discussion. And so uh, my name is Miljana Vajosevic. I'm with the Impact Investments Group at Prudential. And by way of background, we've had an impact investing mandate for over 40 years. Uh, in that time, we've invested close to $3 billion across various impact strategies and private asset classes. Uh, and our portfolio is slated to hit $1 billion uh, later this year or next year. So we're very proud of that. Um, I'm joined today by some amazing uh, experts in their field, and I'll introduce them quickly since we only have a short time together, but starting at my far left, uh, a woman who needs very little introduction is Dr. <laughs> Jennifer Eberhardt. She's one of the nation's leading experts on implicit bias and currently a professor in the Department of Psychology at Stanford and a co-director of SPARC, which is a university initiative to use social psycho uh, psychological research to address pressing social problems. She's done amazing research uh, understanding the role of racial bias in areas such as law inform enforcement and also a topic we'll talk about today, which is um, the asset management industry. Uh, next to Jennifer is Dr. Ashby Monk, who is the Executive Research Director of the Stanford Global Project Center, and his research really focuses on the design and governance of institutional investors, namely pension and sovereign wealth funds. Uh, he's also a co-founder and chairman of Long Game Saving, a personal savings app that uses gamification to encourage positive financial behavior behaviors. Uh, and I should say maybe Sir Darren Dodson, since uh, <laughs> you don't have a PhD, but uh, this is Darren Dodson, who is the founder and managing director of Illumin Capital, which is an impact fund of funds that seeks to increase gender and racial equity within the, the financial markets. So uh, very pleased to have them all here. And among many things, I think the thread that unites us is we have been part of a collaborative working group that over the past three or so years has been working on the relationship, if there is any, uh, about racial bias in the asset management industry. And uh, we were thrilled that the, uh, the survey results and the research findings were published uh, just back in August in PNAS uh, and found some really interesting uh, and I think evocative uh, findings on the relationship between implicit bias, particularly around race and venture capital. And so I will, First, turn it over to Darren to share a little bit about the origin story of the study and really what came to light in the research findings. It is uh, wonderful to be here with all of you. And um, uh, one of the framing pieces that helps us on our journey is um, or some uh, research years ago that was on the $69 trillion in asset management business and the fact that uh, women and people of color own funds and run funds that represent about 1.3% of that. So one of the things that we did and set out to do as we uh, brought together this amazing team that's here on the stage as a looming capital is ask the question um, collectively, uh, why? Why, is that exi why does that exist? And how can we construct a its study and experiment to help to understand uh, why that is? And as Jennifer says, um, data uh, may not uh, fully cure a problem, but it can certainly soothe um, many of us who are faced with the bias, uh, systematic bias that you'll hear from other uh, panelists about. Um, our work at uh, Illumin Capital is, of course, to do this and, and connect, connect and be a partner at this cutting edge research, um, bringing together the experts uh, like Jennifer and Ashby across their fields um, who have pioneered and come together to do this groundbreaking research, bringing together behavioral science and also looking deeply at implicit bias social psychology. And then to put, to put that into practice in the funds that we invest in, in a field of impact investing that really from the very beginning, uh, we would have hoped started with a, a thesis around the outperformance of women and people of color. Um, but, but like its older uh, brother, the broader financial system, impact inv investing is also subject to its own biases. So that's a little bit about the why and the how we got started, and I uh, would love to move on um, and help 
uh, the, the other people on the panel share their uh, stories and origin stories as well. Sure. So for anyone who hasn't um, read the study, I highly encourage it. It's also been fairly prominently featured in various media outlets. And maybe I'll turn to Jennifer and Ashby, if you can just talk a little bit about what the hypothesis was going into the study and what the findings were. Um, that would be great, I think, for those who are less familiar to understand. Yes, I mean, I think when... Uh, uh First of all, it's a pleasure uh, for me to be here. This is my first uh, SOCAP meeting, so uh, thank you for having me. Uh, so yeah, we went into this uh, trying to um, understand uh, why you have the, the, the racial disparities that, that we see uh, in the investment uh, space, especially at a time where you know, lots of organizations are focused on uh, diversity and they're, they're you know, concerns about sort of equity and inclusion and so forth, but this is an industry um, that is, um, you know, it, it's pretty much uh, white and male, and so why is that? And so one um, reason uh, that people uh, believe that this disparity exists is because of the pipeline problem, uh, right? So that you don't have, you know, uh, you know, people of color or women who are, you know, interested or they don't have the... Um, you know, connections or the capital, they don't have the education or experience to, you know, to, to be a, a part of, of um, the industry, and so they don't enter. Um, and what we were interested in is looking at the potential role that racial bias uh, might play uh, in all of this, and, you know, is there, um, you know, is there evidence uh, that there is any, um, you know, a bias there that it, sort of in, a, in addition to whatever uh, sort of pipeline issues that are out there that could contribute to the disparities that we see. And so we, um, we designed a study, um, to, um, a study where we had asset al um, allocators look at um, uh, one-page descriptions of venture capital teams, and we systematically manipulated the race of the managing partner so, uh, with a photograph, and so either that person was black or white, and we also um, systematically varied the uh, qualifications of the team, so they were like um, high-quality or lower-quality teams, and we found um, that um, the black-led uh, venture capital teams, uh, when th these are highly qualified teams, that they were judged to be, uh, um, you know, they, they were judged more negatively, basically, in comparison to white-led teams that were highly qualified. So in terms of their expertise, in terms of their ability, in terms of their experience, even though uh, the information was identical. Um, and so, so that was the, one of the main findings. Uh, and, and the other thing we found was that um, it seemed to be sort of, this is counter to the pipeline um, sort of explanation for the, uh, for the disparities that we see, it seemed to be the case that the, the more qualified the black-led teams were, the more bias they faced. And so that was um, another uh, noteworthy finding. So I think uh, maybe I'll be biased myself and say it's safe <laughs> to say that um, we probably assumed there was bias in asset management. Mm. So I mm -hmm. think that was probably indisputable going in. I'm curious to hear from all of you, and I think Ashby, I'll start with sure. you, given that you have such a great network of institutional mm. investors that you worked with. Were you surprised at all, or were there nuances or aspects of the study that did surprise you? And then I'd love to also hear Jennifer and Darren chime in either from your other work in implicit bias or maybe lived experiences, fundraising and, and otherwise. I, I think it's hard to be surprised ab about what we found. I, I mean, in this industry, it's incredibly homogenous. I, I could probably need all my fingers and toes to count the conferences I've been to where there have been zero people of color. And, and so I think from that perspective, to see that there is this um, finding that racial bias exists, I, you know, I, I had somebody say to me, you know, you've proven, you've proven that water makes, makes things wet. You know, it's just so obvious <laughs> that, that this was a problem. Um, and, and even with that kind of glaring aspect to the industry, which is partly why I wanted to take it on as a, as a research project, I'm still surprised that we found it. You know, like I lived for 20 years in this industry, suspecting that we had a, a bias here. Um, and now, you know, 20 years in, we actually have a finding that was published in a peer-reviewed study, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, that says, you know, we're not crazy. Part of the problem is there is an implicit bias here. And, and that gives me hope that we can then build actions to try to unwind that bias. 
And I think that what, what that also does, um, even though, I mean, to Ashby's point, we're not crazy, um, it's, a, it's a powerful thing to go out and pitch, as many of you in the room might do on a regular basis, to realize that the better you pitch, the more bias you, pay, you face, which I think is a powerful uh, realization and that it's not your work alone to do to be awesome, it's other people's work to see how awesome you are. And... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, so, it, so it has the power for me after pitching about 500 times over the last two years of saying that, um, you know, together we can solve this problem you know, at Lumen Capital, we invest into um, women-led funds, black-led funds, white male-led funds, uh, and all of them do the work of reducing implicit bias, and all of us go on a journey together with our investors to reduce that bias so that we can do the work of having those funds um, and it, it see the humanity and the underestimated returns and value that people bring to the table and do the work essentially over the 10 year process of, of our investment within impact investing to help impact investing really deliver um, on, on, the process, on, the, on the promise of outsized um, market rate uh, returns, which it almost certainly won't um, if it doesn't. And, and Jennifer, I, mean, I know we haven't talked about fiduciaries yet, but I think that's another powerful uh, finding um, that we always talk about in the lab together right. um, as an interdisciplinary team. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, Jennifer, given that you've, you've tackled this issue and explored this issue in other areas such as law enforcement, was there anything that surprised you? Um, it seems like given that you're one of the leading experts in this work, it's, it probably was a no-brainer that the results would be something like this, but was there anything that caught you off guard or did it open your eyes to something that you hadn't really thought of or really considered prior to the study coming out? Yeah, well, one of the issues that I didn't necessarily anticipate was that the asset allocators had a really hard time distinguishing uh, between the uh, black-led teams that were highly qualified and those that were less qualified. They didn't have this problem at all with the white-led teams. They could e easily tell the difference between the two, but with the black-led teams, that was, that was hard. Um, and they also were able to use the prior performance and competence of the white-led teams to make uh, predictions about future performance, and they couldn't do that so much with the black-led teams. And so there was a way in which even though they're facing with the very same information, just, um, you know, uh, seeing a black face kind of turned off the, the, the thinking almost in, in, the, in the way that they normally thought. And so they weren't um, looking at um, information, uh, in, you know, that was sort of diagnostic of performance in the same way when, you know, the, the people, the, the managing partner was black versus white. So I, I think that was, um, you know, something that was somewhat surprising. But then when I think about, I mean, there's a whole literature um, in social psychology in my field looking at sort of categorization. And so if you're thinking about people in terms of their racial category, for example, it's hard to individuate. It's hard to make distinctions among people within that category because you're thinking about them in terms of their race, you know, not in terms of um, what they're bringing to the table. And it seemed like there was some evidence for that here. Yeah. And uh, I think segueing a bit, I know we've chatted collectively as a team on what happens next and what's the call to action. And uh, the study, uh, the findings are still fairly recent, having only been released in August. But I know we have been collectively thinking on, on how do we harness the energy of these findings um, and really have them... Uh, have the impact investing community and just the broader asset management industry take note. And uh, I was mentioning to Ash beyond the way here, I don't know if anyone's tracking the news with Fisher Investments. Um, I think Kenneth Fisher made some fairly sexist remarks only on October 8th. Mm. They've seen a hemorrhaging of $2.5 billion in that time from namely uh, pension funds just saying, I'll take my business elsewhere. And so we have an example of 
uh, one disparaging comment at a conference and a flood, an exodus of capital from a particular asset manager. Uh, I think that's very different from saying, here are findings and now lean into this and mm -hmm. invest more in uh, diverse teams. And I imagine my hypothesis would be that the pace would be slower to invest versus divest. And so uh, I'm curious from all of you, what you think the call to action is and what folks in this room can be do regardless of where they sit, if they're an asset owner, if they sit on a board, uh, if they are an asset manager, and also maybe if they're not involved at all. I think the last thing we would want is people to say, this isn't my issue area, so I'm, um, I'm, I'm sitting out. So I'm just curious, and maybe Ashby, yeah, given sure. um, I think you've had some great thoughts on governance structures and, and how we can embed these types of learnings early in the Absolutely. process and in senior roles to try to make an impact. Yeah, I spent my life studying the design and governance of these massive bureaucracies. I mean, I think what people forget is that um, there's about $100 trillion sitting in these organizations around the world. It's most of the risk capital that powers capitalism, but they were set up because of governments. They set up because there's a tax rule or there's a rule about prefunding a pension plan. So they, they have this weird dynamic where you have these government entities powering capitalism. And if capitalism functions correctly, then the money will come back and fund social welfare. So the, the number of challenges in unraveling how these organizations operate kind of is endless. The fact that they move so quickly on Fisher is astounding. These organizations never move quickly. That's the first thing to know. <laughs> if, if you can make them move at all, you can have a huge and profound impact on the world. But getting them to move quickly, that was never the goal. So, so the, the end game for me here, I'll just go quickly because I see we don't have that much time, but we need to tie this finding to investment performance. These are organizations who have incredible bureaucracies. They're fiduciary bound. They live by prudent person rules. And what that means is everything they do is about generating a return to pay a future welfare, whatever that welfare is. And anything that gets in the way with that, they can shut down. Over the last 30 years, my personal fight over 15 to get them to pay attention to climate change ran into the problem that with climate change, we were asking them to reduce the investable universe by focusing on things that are green and clean and avoiding things that are dirty. Financial theory pushed against us in that case because financial theory says reducing the investable universe reduces the risk-adjusted returns. The beauty of this moment is the bias itself is reducing the investable universe. So we can actually do a bit of a judo move on them and say, look, you may say this climate change issue is untouchable because we're reducing it. And we've had to get very creative with climate. In this case, we don't have to get creative. We can point to the existing theories and say, the bias means you're not treating people of color as you should, it means your market is smaller, it means you're leaving return on the table. In order to make that then real, everybody in the room needs to go to a pension fund board meeting and ask a trustee board, have you seen the study? What are you doing about it? Because they don't do anything otherwise. And I know we're um, just about short of time, but Jennifer, if you have any final thoughts on how you've um, affected change and action in your other work and just any final um, advice for the audience just on how you think we can really affect change following the results here. Yeah, I, mean, I think um, data, that's really important, having sort of metrics that you can follow over time that are, uh, you can hold people accountable to, um, to, you know, you know, bias, you know, lives and kind of comes alive when uh, we don't have agreed upon standards for how to evaluate, uh, you know, the actions or the behavior of other people when those standards are subjective and you, you live in a space where there are objective standards, right, for, um, you know, evaluating uh, performance and so forth. And so you want to try to uh, redirect people, um, you know, from, away from their intuition about who's going to be good and who's going to work out to, you know, actual um, data, um, you know, actual sort of performance its metrics and so forth. So I would say that, and, and that works whether you're looking at the investment space or if you're looking at police departments or if you're looking at, you know, um, you know other, uh, you know, entities, even schools and even, uh, you know, tech companies. Yeah. It's the same, same sort of fundamental issue. Yeah. Well, I'm, unfortunately, we're up with time, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Jennifer just published a book that uh, Darren is holding, <laughs> uh, which is called, um, it's called, Biased, uh, 
uncovering the hidden prejudice that shapes what we see, think, and do. Um, I think it's a fantastic read. So for those of you interested in this work and learning more about how bias affects a range of industries and decisions, uh, we wholly recommend it. So please join me in thanking the panelists for a lively discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.